Welcome everyone and um, I think I'm getting tired of having to do these emergency uh, YouTube lives about what's going on in the UK market. So it would be nice if things were a little bit more stable and we didn't have to have these conversations. But still, here we are and I think it's interesting to understand what's going on, mostly because it does impact our daily lives as we're about to see at the end of this short prezzo. So let me just quickly outline what's going on. And let me start off by talking about about bonds, because I like bonds and uh, it's fairly unusual to like bonds. But most people think that bonds are safe. So if you've got a pension, people always say, well, as you approach retirement, you reduce the amount of bonds, you, do, you reduce the amount of equity and move it into bonds and they're safe. Well, effectively, what the government's done over the last three weeks or so is made bonds not safe at all and much more volatile. Not only that, but they've also made pension funds, defined benefit pension funds, they put them in a place which was very close to collapse. So let's just go through the kind of steps by which that happened. So here's a, here's a government bond. Now this one, if you know how to read these things, the name of the bond is in the top left here, the 3.5%, that's the coupon you receive. It's a fixed rate of interest and then it's going to mature in 2068. So this, if you give the government £100 today, you buy the bond, you get your money back in 2068 in about 40 years' time, and every year you're going to earn about 3.5% in income, which sounds really safe and simple. However, if you actually look at the price of this bond over the course of this year, and I'll make myself... No, I won't. Uh, the red line here is the value of Bitcoin since the beginning of this year. And the blue line is the value of that bond since the beginning of this year. So that bond is down by 57%. Bitcoin down by 58%. So not really that much different from a cryptocurrency right now. Now, of course, it's not just the UK where long duration bonds are selling off. It's just the scale and speed of the sell-off, which has been accelerated by the mini budget from the government. So this actually shows you the price of that bond. If we zoom in onto September, the mini budget happened where the dash red line is. And you can see that that kind of accelerated a very rapid fall in the value of the bond. And then you can see the point at which the Bank of England stepped in and said, look, we're going to start buying these long dated bonds. It's an emergency plan. It's only going to last for about two weeks until October the 14th. And <clears throat> that stabilized the markets. In fact, just the announcement brought yields down and pushed the price of this bond up. However, you can see that that kind of magic stability medicine of the Bank of England statement didn't last that long. And in fact, the price of the bond started falling and the yield started rising again not many days afterwards. So certainly the Bank of England stabilised things by buying those long dated bonds, but the shock and awe didn't last for long. And we'll see why in a second. So there, was actually, there were actually some politicians who said, in fact, it's nothing to do with the mini budget. It's just the fact that the Bank of England has been... Um, didn't raise interest rates as much as the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve recently raised interest rates by 0.75%, whereas the Bank of England raised by 0.5%. And the claim is that that destabilised the pound and that increased yields on UK government debt. So there was a really nice letter that was sent from the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, John Cunliffe, to Mel Stride, who's chair of the Treasury Committee, showing exactly the timeline. And if you look at the bond yield, remember the yield goes in the opposite direction to prices. So when gilt yields go up, it means the prices are plummeting. You can see the fiscal event is kind of a euphemism for the mini budget. And then the point at which the gilt purchases start is when the yield starts to fall dramatically. So I think it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that the MPC decision had a small effect when they announced that there'd just be a 50 basis point raise in interest rates, that increased yields a little bit. But then when yields just went off the map was when the fiscal event happened. And what stabilised it was the gilt purchases. So 
if you actually read that letter, it's pretty shocking reading. So how big was the jump in yields? Well, according to Cunliffe, it's more than three times larger than any other historical move in 30-year gilt yields. So a very rapid four-day period rise in yields that's completely unprecedented. Now, if you give a shock to the financial system, it's going to creak and you'll see where the weak points are. And in the case of the UK, the weak point was um, the LDI market. So if you're not familiar with this, the, the idea here is if you've got a defined benefit pension, if you want to boost the returns on the defined benefit pension, you don't have to buy government bonds. You can buy government bonds and you can buy things like equity, maybe a bit of property, maybe some packaged up mortgages, all of which have higher income and greater risk than government bonds. And that way, in order to reach your targets to meet your liabilities for your pensioners, you don't have to invest so much. And that means you've got some cash left over, which you can actually then lever up. So you can increase the leverage on a small proportion of your of your assets. So you have something called a matching pool, which is a bunch of bonds, which mature roughly when you need the money. So that roughly matches your payments that you have to make to your pension holders. But then on top of that, you're boosting the yields with this LDI strategy, as it's called, a liability driven investment strategy. Now, there's a really nice diagram in the letter from Cunliffe, which explains to politicians what went wrong. So you can see here before the yield spiked and after the yield spiked, what they're showing is that the assets of the average pension fund were a little bit underfunded. So, you know, maybe the assets were worth 80% of what they'd have to pay out in future. Now, as interest rates increased, the value of the assets went down and so did the value of the liabilities, because if you're paying a cash flow in future, it's worth less when yields are higher. So the overall funding ratio improved, which seems like a good thing. But what happened was that you have this leveraged component, which is something called the repo market, where you've bought gilts via repo. And there's some kind of leverage in here, which is greater than two times in this example from Cunliffe. And you can see that the value of this portfolio has fallen very rapidly. And you have this little capital buffer here, which is used to pay your margin calls when gilt yields move higher. Now, normally you'd set aside enough capital for normal market movements, plus a little bit extra for a shock because you have to cover your margin calls. However, the yields rose so much and so quickly that this capital was almost completely exhausted. So what could the pension fund do? Well, what they had to sell was gilts. So in other words, you've got gilts falling in value, which in turn pushes up yields. That increases the volatility of these funds. They have to sell something to pay their margin calls, and they have to sell gilts into the falling market. So what you have here is a kind of spiral where the fund is trying to sell gilts into an illiquid market. Imagine you're a market maker for gilts. Everybody's trying to sell to you. Nobody wants to buy. Well, you're not going to be particularly keen on, on giving a good price if that's the case. So the price fell very sharply and it's illiquid because the traders probably didn't want to trade much because it's a huge risk to them. And so the, some of the pension funds couldn't actually sell their gilts. So the speed and the scale of the moves is really what the problem was. Of course, yields were going up anyway. That's true across the world. It's just that this budget pushed up the yields so fast that it destabilized the market. And DB pension funds couldn't get capital enough in, into their fund quickly enough in order to pay their margin calls. So that's why the Bank of England had to act very quickly. And what really worries me in the letter is just one sentence. It says, some funds had already tried to sell gilts and failed to do so. So just think about that. Somebody can't sell developed market government bonds in what should be one of the most liquid markets. So that is a real crisis because gilts are the kind of financial plumbing as our US treasuries, which makes the whole system work. They are the risk-free assets, supposedly. And when you destabilize that, 
you destabilize the entire financial system. Now, how much has the Bank of England been buying? Well, supposedly this is shock and awe. They set a limit of five billion per day. So on day one, they bought a billion. On day two, they bought 1.4, day three, 1.2. But then effectively, they stopped buying. That's not because people weren't asking them to buy. So these LDI funds, it's done via an auction process. They put in a, an offer to, uh, to sell their bonds and uh, the Bank of England simply said no to some of the bids. So it's only over the last few days when they've started buying again. And so I think one of the problems is that the shock and awe isn't very shocking anymore. So we've, that's why we've seen the prices start to fall again and the yields start to spike upwards again. So I think from the Bank, Bank of England's point, maybe they should be doing more in order to stabilise the system. Now, what is it that shocked markets in the first place? Why is it that yield suddenly spiked? Well, this is a forecast of how much the UK government is going to have to borrow in the years ahead. So in a normal year, you can see they'd issue about, what, 20 billion in, in bonds. But then you can see, you know, when we come back to normal, it's back to about 20, maybe even 30 billion in, a, in an expensive year when the government's spending a lot. But over the next two years, you can see that the size of the spending just balloons hugely. So we go from 20 billion to five times that. And that's for a two year period. Why is that? Well, if you're cutting taxes at the same time as spending more for the energy price guarantee, then you're not going to balance the books and you have to kind of paste over the difference by borrowing. And they're borrowing a huge amount. And that's what spooked markets, because they didn't ask for a costing of this from the Office for Budget Responsibility. They simply went ahead and did this and then communicated it very poorly. Now, what people, if you're a bond investor, what you care about is, is the de debt sustainable? Can the government continue to pay the debt or is it looking more likely that it's going to run into problems servicing the debt in future? And this looks like an unsustainable rise in the amount of debt. That's what spooked bond markets and that's why yields suddenly gapped higher and continue to move higher. Now, the government's refused to back down on the tax cuts. So you can see the additional costs which are going to come from cutting taxes. So this is the amount of revenue which the government's going to lose out on by reversing the rise in national insurance contributions and also the um, cancel cancellation of the rise in, in, in corporation tax. So those two measures are the most expensive. But you can see that the thing they did step back on was the additional rate of tax, which only made a tiny difference. It was about two billion in the overall cost of their future plans. So that's why I think what the government's done is not step back at all from their budget, which caused the instability. So given the fact that the Bank of England's not being very shocking and awing, and the government hasn't stepped back from its huge spending, you can see why yields are still rising and prices are falling because nothing's changed. And then yesterday, this kind of beggar's belief, Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, was at a conference and he said that my message to the funds involved and all the firms is you've got three days left now because they said they were going to stop buying on, Oct on October the 14th and Bailey says that's going to happen no questions asked. You've got to get this done. In other words, stabilise your LDI instability problems by then. So what can these funds do? Well, they can try and sell other assets. They can try and get capital in other ways. Perhaps they can ask their... Um, perhaps they can get capital via their... Uh, via the companies which are funding the, the pensions. But it's going to be pretty difficult, I'd have thought, to do that if you have to come up with billions on fairly short, short notice. But that was what Bailey said. Now, if that's all that had happened, that would have been difficult, I'd say, for markets, because the bank is essentially saying we're going to take you off life support and you're on your own. 
But then what happened was after this headline came out about um, ruling out Bank of England intervention, just hours later, the FT and Bloomberg were talking about the Bank of England sig signalling to lenders that it would be prepared to prolong bond purchases. And apparently this was via private communication. So we've got two different messages coming out of the bank. Are they going to save the the guilt system? Are they going to save the price of guilt? Are they going to step in and save the day? Or are they not? Because at the moment, what we're getting is two different conflicting messages. And I think that's much worse than just giving one message, whatever it is. So I think the, the messaging has also been handled very poorly by the Bank of England. Now, if we look at the gilt yields, you can see the intervention improved things. This is bringing us up to pretty much yesterday. And this is Bailey's warning about pension funds when he said, we're not going to give you any more money, you're on your own, and gilt's widened. So there's nothing new really here which is going to improve things. And I think that's what worries me. And it also is worrying bond markets. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, this is all about bonds. It doesn't really affect me. Well, yes, it does, because if you have a mortgage or you borrow in any way, then this is increasing the cost of borrowing for everybody because guilt set the risk-free rate. Think of it like layers of a cake. Every other borrowing rate is just layered on top of that risk-free rate with a credit spread. Now, that credit spread just reflects the riskiness of those other borrowers relative to the Bank of England, which is a risk-free borrower, hopefully. So when you borrow, the, the rate at which you borrow will be the bank rate plus that credit spread. So when the bank rate increases, so does your yield and probably your credit spread too. Now, the reason why that's worrying in the UK is that if we look at price to income ratio, so look at the price of the, the average price of a house divided by the average income, usually you'd expect that to be around four and a half times. That's the long run average since 1992. But since we've had this era of free money, you can see what's happened to that price to earnings ratio. It's spiked. It fell back a bit in 2008 with the global financial crisis. It kind of languished at around five times for a while. But notice that since we've had zero interest rates, banks have effectively been lending more as a multiple of income. And we're now at the record level. In fact, I think it's the highest level it's ever been for the price to income ratio on average for the UK. So we've got a very expensive housing market. And at the same time, we've got a Bank of England, which has to fight the government's inflationary fiscal budget, because if they're cutting taxes, then effectively people will be able to spend more, companies will be able to spend more, and that increases inflation. So the Bank of England is having to tighten monetary policy and raise interest rates much more sharply to combat that. So we've got the tug of war between fiscal policy, the government spending, and the Bank of England's policy, the monetary policy, which is having to try and douse the flames of inflation. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you look at the Bank of England's policy rate historically, and this is for data going back to 1960. So on the right here, you can see where the Bank of England's policy rate was more than 15%. I don't quite remember that, but I, maybe I do. Maybe I do. When, it was, when I was a young boy, that's where we were. And we've got the price to income ratio, how expensive house prices are relative to that rate. Notice that when the bank rate's very high, the price to income ratio is low. House prices go down when the cost of borrowing increases. It makes sense because you can borrow less. But in the era of free money, which is pretty much where we still are, where the current bank rate is 2.25%, that's where the big red dot is, where we are today. And the price to income ratio is seven times. But what happens if we dial up the bank rate? Oh, look, the price to income ratio goes down, down, down to something like five times. So this is not a good outlook for UK house prices, because if the price to income ratio comes down hugely, then the price of houses falls as well. So this is one of the consequences of more expensive borrowing and a very rapid increase in the cost of borrowing. Now, if you're interested in this, my video for this Saturday on YouTube, which you'll be able to watch, members on Pension Craft can watch it right now, is gonna be about the housing market. So 
I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about it for the UK, for the US and come up with a house price forecast and a kind of worst case, best case analysis, which is what I do every time I make that forecast, because you should never believe a central case. You should always try and say, you know, how good could it be? How bad could it be? So anyway, that's coming out on Saturday if you're interested. And I think you'll find that interesting. Also in our podcast, we're talking about interest rates and uh, which I do with with Michael Pugh. So please do listen to that. Um, it's many happy returns. Right. So let me see if I can actually get the um, many happy returns podcast page. And just so you can see the uh, just so you can see the um, the episode I'm talking about. So Michael's really good at the funny names. So rate accompli, a rising interest rates bad for all assets. So here we're talking about, you know, what can you buy when interest rates are increasing? Because there are certain sectors, types of asset which suffer a lot. And there are others which don't suffer so much. And there are some which actually are designed to increase in value when, when interest rates increase. So do have a look at that or listen to that rather. Um, and uh, now I will answer some questions. So uh, Laura, I believe, is going to uh, pop them into a document for me. And um, yeah, let me just pull up that document. And yeah. So don't forget, if you are keen on learning about investing, we have a community, pensioncraft.com. You can join our community there and you can learn with like-minded people. We've got about 800 members who are surprisingly sticky. A lot of them stay with us. Some of them have been with us for years. And the idea is that you kind of learn with like-minded people. And the idea is that you have long-term, a long-term mindset to investing. It's not, but not about getting rich quick. It's about keeping your costs low, diversifying and being in it for the long haul. So people tell me they like it. So maybe you'll like it too. It'd be great if you could join us. So anyway, that's on pensioncraft.com. So the first question is from Ned Flanders. Nice to hear from you, Ned, who's done a super chat. So please do a super chat because obviously, you know, that gives us a revenue. We'd really appreciate it if you do that. Um, if you don't do that, do subscribe to our channel because maybe you'll like our content in future. And Ned says, Sterling Hedge Global Equity um, is FTSE 250 a buying opportunity at the moment? So, well, certainly the FTSE 250s come down a lot. So let's look at one of those FTSE 250 trackers. So let's use the Vanguard one and we'll just look at its financials and its price. There we go. So I'll move down here. So here we go. The current yield on that is 3.5%. Now remember that the gilts are paying you over 4% for a one year gilt. So immediately you can see that if a risk free asset, well kind of risk free, a one year bond is paying you more than 4%, equity is paying you 3.5 with huge volatility and with prices plummeting, well, which one do you think might be better? I and mean, you people usually go for the safe option because one year bonds, remember what we looked at, the one that had sold off a lot was long duration. Short duration is much more cash-like. It's much less volatile. So that, you know, you can have very little volatility and earn 4%. This thing you can earn 3.5. So that immediately makes it less attractive. And here's the FTSE 250 over the course of this year. And you can see it's essentially been a one-way street. The yield's been increasing as the price falls. I guess the worry now is that people, companies are going to cut their dividends because if we have a soft patch for the UK economy, the revenue of companies goes down and they only voluntarily give you dividends, remember. If they're worried about less revenue, they can actually cut the dividend. So the worry next, I guess, is that companies are going to stop start cutting their dividends to survive through a soft patch and through very high energy prices and increasing costs of running their business. So, you know, that's my worry for the FTSE 250. You know, we've got a weak economy. 
we've got fiscal policy pulling in the opposite direction as monetary policy, we're going to have to have a very restrictive monetary policy in order to curb inflationary fiscal policy. That's going to make house prices suffer. It's going to make the cost of borrowing higher for companies, for households. All of that is just not a great backdrop for equity. So, you know, is it an opportunity with the FTSE 250 now, given that it's so cheap? All you can really say for the FTSE 250 is that it's cheap. Now, your point, Ned Flanders, which is a good one, is that sterling's devalued a lot recently. So some people think if I had to buy US equity now or global equity, because sterling's weak, you're going to buy less. So it's effectively making foreign investments more expensive. And if sterling starts to strengthen once you've bought, it reduces the return on that foreign investment. So if you do go domestic, you don't have to worry about that currency risk as much. Unfortunately, there is a kind of slightly negative effect, which is a lot of companies, and certainly in the FTSE 100, earn their revenue abroad. They're quite international companies. So, you know, if they're converting money back to a strengthening sterling, they're going to get less pounds when they do the conversion. So that's the kind of negative if sterling does strengthen. But it's certainly less, I think, than, you know, the direct effect on the currency. So if you do want to buy international currency, a lot of pension crafters at the moment on Slack, that's our kind of chat application, we've been talking about getting currency hedged equity funds. Or if you go for domestic stocks, of course, you don't need a currency hedge because it's in sterling. So that, I think that's Ned's point. So what the UK has going for it, it's cheap and it's domestic currency for UK investors. And for foreign investors, you know, if you're US based, wow, it's looking really cheap because sterling's cheap and, you know, the valuations are low as well. So, yeah, I can see it could be attractive. And at a certain point, it'll be amazingly attractive. I don't think we're quite there yet, given the backdrop. I think we have further to fall until the government either backtracks on its fiscal plans and somehow shows how it's going to make debt sustainable or... Um, there's some other kind of material proof that, which will be hard to come by, that growth is going to improve based on their plan, which, frankly, they've done a very poor job of convincing people about the people that matter, which is investors. Right. Oh, we've got lots of questions now. OK, so um, how are we doing for time? OK, well, OK, well, I'll just answer these questions and then we'll finish. Um so Ciba, Ciba L is one of our supporters on YouTube. Thank you, Ciba. He says, thanks for all the information shared. Very clear. Great. Could you please comment on how this may affect the S&P index, for instance? Well, funnily enough, I mean, everyone says that the UK is not very important in the global economy. And lots of people on, on FinTwit, financial Twitter, have been joking about the tail wagging the dog. But, you know, this is one thing we've exported very successfully, which is volatility. If you look at the US bond market, the US equity market, it does seem to have suffered a little wobble due to what's going on in the UK. So, haha, right. So, you know, we have had an effect. But seriously, I think the the currency effect is the big one, right? That's the that's the one everyone's worried about. And but the direct effect on the on the S&P is very limited. That's because the US generates a lot of its revenue domestically. It is a quite hermetically sealed economy from that sense of from that point of view a lot of revenue is generated in the US so you know as an export destination the UK is not that important to the US so I think the direct effect on corporate revenues is going to be limited the direct effect on the dollar also very limited the dollar has just been very strong versus every currency so, you know, I think the effect will be limited. It is the tail wagging the dog, after all. We're a much smaller economy and our equity market is 4% of global equity. The US market is 60% or 55% of global equity. So, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we're smaller than Apple when it comes to market capitalization for equity. So I think the effect on the, the direct effect on the S&P 500 is limited. Um, and it's only, you know, the yield shock, if that translates to the US, that could be a problem. But, you know, the US doesn't have an equivalent to the UK LDI, liability-driven investment pension schemes. 
So I don't think they're in the same boat as us. So I think the effect will be fairly limited SIBO. But certainly if you're a UK buyer of US stuff, then the currency effects the biggie. And it's made the US more expensive as sterling has weakened. Uh, Minsk, Minsk, Minsk says, thank you for supporting us, Minsk, Minsk, Minsk. I did manage to pronounce it. If gilts are risk-free, why is there a sell-off in them? Surely investors will be paid the coupon regardless. Yes. Oh, there's a note from Laura. She says, go back to full screen. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> Everyone is reading that with me. Right. So if gilts are risk-free, why is there a sell-off in them? OK, well, they're not risk-free. They are risk-free from a credit perspective, but they don't have risk, no risk in a duration perspective. So let's say you're not going to hold them to maturity. In that case, if you sell them before they mature, the price could be anything, right? Whereas if you buy them and hold them to maturity, the beauty of a bond is you never face the market again, ever. You just get your money back and the coupons until it matures. So if you're a buy and hold single gilt investor, and again, this is something we've been discussing a lot recently on the Pension Craft Slack forum. If you're one of those investors, then you don't care if yields increase or decrease, really, if you just buy a gilt and hold it to maturity. You're going to make your 4% between now and then. You get your coupons, which are fixed. You get your 100 back from the government. And it's very, very, very unlikely that the government's going to default, even now, because sure, there's going to be a debt, debt, sustainability, debt sustainability issues, a slight issue. But is there any question of the government not repaying its debt? debt? No. The, the UK government hasn't defaulted for centuries. You know, that's why they called gilt edge, gilt edged securities. That was a sign of quality. If you have the certificates, they had that gilt edge and it meant something. So, you know, I think a default is very unlikely. The credit risk is zero, very close to zero. But the duration risk, if you sell it before maturity, is big if it's a long duration government bond. And it's these long dated gilts, remember, which are causing all the all the worries at the moment. So, yeah, that, that's why it's better to buy a single gilt at the moment than buying a whole bond fund, because essentially you're buying a portfolio of bonds if you buy a bond fund, a gilt fund, and they may be forced to sell if money flows out of the fund or if prices fall, you know, they might be, as the bonds mature, they have to kind of replace them. So there's a continual churn inside the, inside the, inside the bond fund, whereas if you hold a single bond, you don't sell it. You have the choice about when to sell. The bond fund doesn't have that choice. So they often have to sell and crystallize a loss. That's the difference between a fund and a single bond. So that's why a lot of us have been talking about buying single bonds now. Um, so risk free just means credit risk free, not duration risk free. There's a super chat from Ray. Thank you, Ray. That's great. Recommendation for someone cash heavy right now. Well, look, you know, Look at my video recently about big being greedy, right? Why am I getting greedy? Well, because valuations are more reasonable now. So, you know, why does that matter? Well, the time you buy equity is when it's cheap, when there's a crisis. So if you buy an index, then it always recovers. You know, global index, a US index always recovers back to its previous all time high. It's simply a question of when. So if you buy at a depressed price, that increases your return. It's simply a question of how long it takes to get there. So if we're down 20% on the S&P since the peak, if we go back in one year, of course, that's not going to happen. It's unlikely to happen, but that would be a 20% gain. It, in fact, to get back to where we were would be much bigger. It would be about a 40% gain because of the way the percentages work. But it's a question of simply how long until we get there. And the longer it takes, the less the annualized return. But we will get there. So when do you buy equity? You buy when it's cheap. So these crises create opportunities for long-term investors. So if you are investing for a long period of time, Ray, all I'd say is now is a better time to buy. And that's if you want to learn more about that, just watch my video about why I'm getting greedy. Um, so, yeah. 
Um, next question is from Daniel Cooper, who's this is also a super chat who says thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's just to say thank you, thank you, uh, Daniel. That's really kind of you. He says that this is all looking super bleak. Thanks for the vid. I think I think we'll get through it. It's just kind of embarrassing what's going on right now and how badly it's being handled by the Bank of England and also by the government. So I think that's just making it worse. So that's what is, is frustrating about it. There's also a super chat from Amir Ketobchi, Iruni Astina, um, who says, Hi, Roman, could you speculate what's going to happen on Friday? <laughs> Will the Bank of England, I guess what you mean is, um, Amir, is will the Bank of England start, um, start, stop buying government bonds? Will it stop buying, it, will, it, will it end its guilt programme like Bailey said it would? Um, personally, I think it's going to get worse. You know, they haven't fixed the problem. The mismatch between fiscal and monetary policy is still there. The government's going ahead with its not reinstating higher taxes. So all of this kind of unsustainability of debt problem is still there. Maybe they could bring forward the Office for Budget Responsibility report to stabilise people and kind of stabilise markets and soothe people's nerves. But at this point, I don't think the OBR is going to be saying that this is going to generate a lot of growth. I think that's my, my guess would be that that's what they're going to say. And it's certainly going to increase debt. So... You know, I'm not sure that would work. It's not going to pour oil on troubled waters, that OBR report. If anything, it might make things worse. So I think the Bank of England will will probably ramp things up again and extend the programme. They may wait for a few days just to see how bad things get and the things will get worse, I suspect, and then they'll step in. So that's my prediction. There you go. And Blah Blah, who also did a super chat, thank you, says gold, worth a world now or another commodity. Well, gold, remember, doesn't like it when the dollar's strong or when interest rates are increasing, both of which are happening right now and pretty much continuing. Now, if gold were to step back, certainly when the Fed starts stepping back from raising interest rates, you know, which will probably do towards the end of this year, they'll slow down the rate hikes when they get to, an, to a kind of restrictive monetary policy of about 4%, 4.2, 4.3, something like that. At that point... You know, that's when gold might kind of get more attractive because that's the point of that's the point at which, you know, rates will stop increasing. But then, you know, equity might start to go up again in the US when the Fed steps back a little bit and stops hiking. So, you know, it really depends what happens to earnings, I think, in Q3 and Q4. If we see a material decrease in earnings, then that's not priced in at the moment so that could make equity fall further and that would be good for gold because fear generally is good for gold and you know if we have a credit problem if credit defaults start picking up which i'd expect probably will happen as the u.s economy softens also in europe we'd see a pickup in defaults then yeah i think that would also be good for gold so really it's a matter of timing you know do equity markets improve before earnings start to fall or maybe if earnings don't fall um i think you know if, if earnings don't fall then that's not so good for gold but if we get earnings falling strongly towards the end of this year and credit markets kicking off with more defaults then i'd expect that would be good for gold julian mitchell who um, very generously given us five pounds for his super chat says good evening I'm an expat earning US dollars. Oh, that sounds great. Considering Vanguard FTSE 100 or 250 funds, does this sound like a good plan at the moment? Yeah. I mean, if you're a dollar investor, the UK is looking dirt cheap. It's paying a fat dividend. And, you know, if sterling does strengthen again, it's going to be good for you. Whereas for us in the UK, it would, it would have the opposite effect. So, assuming things do improve which of course they will eventually for the uk the fair price the fair value of sterling is around 140 144 by purchasing power parity so you know it's a hell of a lot higher than it is today so if we go back to ppp the ppp fair value of of sterling versus the dollar you know that could give you a big boost as well as the 
recovery in the FTSE 250. So, I, you know, I mean, if you are going to do it, I'd go for the 250 because that's the one that's depressed more and it's the one that would bounce back more. And it's also looking cheaper. The FTSE 100 is more of a kind of multinational energy pharmaceutical type index. So very different. Look, anyway, look, I've, I've kind of taxed your time too much here. And um, I th oh, Laura says someone else. OK, <laughs> OK, another super chat. Um, David Pinzanis says, um, is there an ISA way to buy individual bonds? And is it a good time to buy a UK bond? Yeah, you can you can buy individual bonds in your ISA. You can't do it on Vanguard's UK platform, but you can on other platforms like AJ Bell, Interactive Investor, and Hargreaves Lansdowne, for example. But those, for a fact, I know, sell individual gilts. So just look for, you know, Interactive Investor gilts, and the, you can see a list of them, or Hargreaves Lansdowne gilts. Just check how much it costs to trade them. But they can go in an ISA, they can go in a SIP, and on a UK gilt, even if it's not in, a, in an ISA, I think as long as it was issued after 1992, <laughs> you don't pay capital gains on it. I think you still pay income tax on the income, but you should check that. I'm not a tax guy, um, but you can buy them. Yeah, on some platforms in the UK. Is it a good time to buy a UK bond? Well, yeah. I mean, if you buy a single bond, this is the point. This is why we were all talking about it on, on Slack on Pension Craft, which is, yeah, I mean, you're going to earn 4%. If the yield curve's flat at 4% across the yield curve from one year out to 30 years, you wouldn't buy the really volatile stuff at the far end. You'd buy the one-year bond or the two-year bond and just bag the 4% per year. You know, that's that's what you do. Oh, so there's another question here from BTL who says, how safe is short-dated money market funds? Are they really cash-like? Appreciate all the content. And thank you for the super chat, BTL. Well, remember the type of things which short-dated money f market funds buy. In the US at the moment, they're buying a lot of repo. So you see the US repo reverse repo market's gone above like $2 trillion, I think. Well, it's money market funds which are, which are doing the reverse repo. So very safe short-term investments. Um, or it might be commercial paper. These are loans to companies for 180 days or less, usually very high credit quality companies. And also deposits with banks, which take a little bit of bank credit risk. So are they completely safe? No. Uh, but they do very carefully manage the credit risk. So the idea with a money market fund is you put a pound in, you take a pound out and you get a tiny bit of interest on top of it, which is the cash rate of interest, which used to be zero until about six months ago. Now it's around 2%. So cash-like um, rates of interest. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can, they are cash-like in that sense, very low volatility. Are they as safe as cash? No, because you know cash is as safe as it gets, as long as it's parked with a bank, which has a good FSCS guarantee which goes, it goes up to 85K per person per institution. And yeah, the money market funds are more risky than that. Um, but they may give you a higher income than you can get on some, on some cash accounts. Um, but are they risky? Yeah, they are risky because there, it's a little bit of credit risk, um, but, but very little and almost no duration risk. That's why they're cash-like. So not exactly zero duration like cash, just a very small duration. Uh, and are they safe? Yeah, I'd say they're safe. I mean, I wouldn't have any qualms about putting money into a money market fund at the moment, for example, compared to long dated gilts, for example. Right. So I think we will try and end it there. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope it was helpful. And don't forget, you can join us on Pension Craft and get, you know, ask a question anytime you like, join the discussion. It's very lively, it's very friendly, I'd say. And you've got lots of members only content. Plus we now have some special tools so that you can monitor markets, macroeconomics, and uh, do that as a member on our website. So if you do want to learn about becoming a member, go to pensioncraft.com, listen to our podcast, Many Happy Returns, and please do subscribe to our channel because it helps us and it's absolutely free. So thank you for thank you everyone for joining us. 
and let's hope that things start to calm down.